Good morning, everyone. Ah, thank you. Somebody's awake. All right, how's everybody doing this morning? Awesome, good, good. Thank you for everybody that's tuned in as well on the video feed. Um, it's a beautiful morning out there. The weather is fantastic. We've had a long weekend and it's just been great. Um, anybody that's a farmer probably just loves the weather. There's rain, there's heat, and it's just, everything's growing like crazy. It's nice. Anyway, welcome here this morning. Uh, we're here to praise Father as a collective. We can do that every day, wherever we are, but today we're here to praise God together. Um, several announcements. The nursery is asking for the help. They need one more person to fill the 11 o'clock um, schedule. So if you have any questions, um, there's a sheet on the door of the nursery giving some uh, information there. The phone number on there is still for Helen Weeb. Um, she has resigned. Tina Peters has now taken over. And if anybody uh, would like, uh, come to Corny Unger or myself. We'll give you Tina's phone number and um, you can contact her that way. But they're looking to, for one person to fill the position for the 11 o'clock service. Um, Jimmy, he was just here. There he is. Yeah, Jimmy's looking for um, some instrumentalists. So he's looking for um, someone to play piano, guitar, bass, drums, anything. You have a flute, violin, bring it in. Uh, so he's just looking for help. Hey, anybody got a trumpet? Oh, man. Okay. Anyway, yes. So any instrument. I love the trumpet. And um, no. That's all I do. Anyway, sorry for the jokes. Um, please uh, see Jimmy. Um, they're also looking for some vocalists. If anybody wants to sing, um, this would be up here Sunday mornings for worship nights, uh, Christmas specials, whatever. Um, come on up. And then communion service is next Sunday morning. Uh, it will be held during morning services. So um, come on out. Welcome, or you're all welcome. All members are welcome to, no, any baptized members are welcome to join us for communion. So that'll be next Sunday at 9.30 and at 11. And then I was just told that there is a pastor ordination scheduled for September 11th. It's a Saturday. Uh, so they've been toying with a date and they finally came up with it. Pastor ordination will be September, Saturday, September 11th. That's it, that's it for the announcements. Uh, prayer requests, uh, let's keep Anna and Daniel Lowen and family in prayer, Peter and Susanna Wall, and, uh, hi Susanna, how are you? Good. And also, let's uh, keep the baptism candidates uh, in our prayers. They got a, they're pretty excited. Uh, I've seen them here a few evenings already this week, or they've been here a few evenings, and uh, it's pretty exciting. I see Ben and Susie sitting back there. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's great. Let's keep praying for the candidates. And then, I'm going to read a scripture this morning. It is from Psalms 62, verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. My soul wait in silence for God alone, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my refuge. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my glory rest on God. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. And I share this because in the last little while, we've been doing some renovations, and I don't, I'm not trusting in God's timing. I want everything in my time, and it makes me very tense, very nervous. So I read this, that God is my, re my strength, my refuge is in God. And I was trying to do things on my own, and I was very upset, not upset, frustrated. So this really struck me. Love that scripture. Again, it's Psalm 62, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, with that, let's bow and let's pray. 
Father, this morning, um, we come before you, and not just today, but in general, we just want to be thankful for all that you are in us and all that you have done for us. We thank you for killing the old self and then being resurrected in your spirit. It's a new life. And sometimes it feels like that new life. We don't know how to grasp it. It's not there, but when we go to scripture and you are our refuge, you are our strength, you are our salvation. You're everything for us. And I just pray that we can rest in that. Not in, our, in and of ourselves doing things, but all things through you. Thank you for your greatness and thank you for your majesty and thank you for being our salvation. We have no other way but through you. Thank you. And then this morning, I want to just pray for um, Anna Lowen, Daniel, and the children, um, extended family. As they're facing an unknown and not sure of what the outcome will be, but may they rest in you. And may we lift them up continually to your throne of grace. And may we support them um, in this earthly life by sending them a message or giving them a card or just uh, letting them know that we're here for them. May we do all things through you so that you will get the glory and the honor, but may you comfort and care for that family. We also want to lift up uh, Peter and Susanna Wall. Um, as Frank is uh, battling with his back pain, and may you strengthen him and the family. May you carry them and hold them. And may they just rest in your uh, lap, come to you with everything. Although we want to be self-sufficient, may you sustain them with whatever they need. And I pray, Father, this morning, just for peace and comfort. And then also I want to lift up the uh, new baptism candidates. Um, we've seen some getting sprinkled, we've seen some getting uh, submerged, and they come up and they're soaking wet, but they're all beaming with a smile. And it's just the newness that they're experiencing, experiencing then. May that just carry on. May you continually just lift them, and may they continually be looking to you to be lifted up like that to be just um, walking in your spirit. Um, we just pray for each one there as they will continue to grow and get to know you better, that all glory is yours. Um, and then also this morning, I um, want to pray for the deacon elect election that will come up. It is going to get planned. We will do a deacon election, and you already know the date. But I just pray, Father, that we won't con or that we won't grow weary about praying for them, for it's also part of your work. It's all yours. We give that to you. May you um, do with it as you please. Um, and this morning, I want to pray for the message for Mike. Um, may your grace just spill out upon us as we listen to the message, and may we be edified in knowing that. This message is yours, and Mike will just be, the, be your voice. Uh, thank you that he's willing to do this, and we thank you for each one that has come out to listen. May you be um, greatly uh, edified in this, through this message. Again, Father, we pray all things according to your will in your son's name. Amen. Morning, everyone. How's everybody today? Jake's been trying to get you guys to engage, and then you guys just haven't been engaging, so that's okay. I won't, I won't wait for you guys to engage in greeting. Uh, Jason, can I get a glass of water, please? It's like got a schlucks. That's about it. 
Thank you, sir. Look, that's my deech for today. <laughs> if you even know what that meant, because I say everything wrong <clears throat> in, uh, when it comes to, to German. I have my, uh, my Jinglish accent um, when I try to speak German, and nobody knows what I'm saying. Um, so I'll just stick to English. I want to greet you with actually a bunch of greetings um, that Paul writes. And maybe you'll pick up on it, and if you don't, I'm going to tell you. So see if you can pick up on the continual theme. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians, Paul writing to the church, his first letter to the church at Corinth that's recorded in scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, um, Verses 2 through 3 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you in Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We find Paul writing his second letter to the church at Corinth, and there he says, verses 1 and 2, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. Ephesians, so now Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Jesus. And then we turn into the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. Colossians, finally, Colossians. My last greeting for you this morning is Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. It says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossus, grace to you and peace from God our Father. I don't know if you picked up on it, and it's not all of Paul's greetings, but a lot of Paul's greetings, who does he call the people? Saints. And, and I really love and um, <clears throat> am encouraged uh, that in twice writing to the churches at Corinth, like you just got to read through those letters, and if you read them as a book, you're just like, Wow. That church at Corinth needed a lot of help. They needed a lot of prayer, and they needed a lot more of Paul to give them some correction because they were doing nasty things. So the title of today's message is Perspective. Whose Perspective? So in, in all of Paul's letters and, and going through Paul's letters, we can read, and it's not always about correction, but we read about what God is doing and then also a reflection of what it looks like when you have God living in and through you. And Paul sees them as saints. Not only, um, sorry, he knows their actions, he knows what they're doing, and yet he still calls them saints. So I, want, I, I ask the question, through whose eyes is Paul looking at the people of God? Is he looking at them from a judgmental perspective, as a behavior perspective, and identifying with who they are based on behavior? Or how is he able to say, get this, you read the letters of Corinth, you find that the men are sleeping with their stepmoms, and he still calls them saints. You're like, whoa, whoa. like, they've crossed the line. Absolutely they have. But from whose perspective is Paul looking at these people? That makes me ask the question, from, whom's, from whose perspective do I view the church of God? Am I looking at it from a perspective of behavior? Am I looking at it from a perspective of what's actually happened? How do I view SMC, even greater than SMC, all the churches in Ontario. From whose perspective am I going to look at the church? That, that leads me to another question. Whose perspective do you look through when you look at the church? 
Is it a perspective of judgment? Is it a perspective of scrutiny? Is it a perspective of behavior? Whose perspective do you look at when you are looking at the church? Something that I find very challenging. Today, it's going to seem like I have a hard time staying on track, but there's so many, there's so many faucets of, of today's title, perspective, that we can look at, and there's so many rabbit trails. It's not even a rabbit trail. It's actually just another faucet of what we can actually begin to explore. And I pray that as you walk with me through this journey, and we begin to see and maybe, maybe the Spirit of God will prompt you in a total different perspective that I'm even speaking. But I want you to just be able to reel it in to something that I find difficult to find today, which is the truth. What's the truth? You see, I believe the world has done an amazing job. And I will even say the church as a whole has done an amazing job in brainwashing us brainwashing us to a point of believing that our perspectives are truth and we no longer lean on the truth to actually formulate what is actual truth. It's a very, very dangerous, dangerous line to walk. I'll just, I'm just going to give you some fun examples of perspective becoming truth. Let's just take a look at vehicles, the automotive industry. What's better, Ford or GM? Right? I, I've seen people actually get red in the face, almost ready to start a fist fight when they're just literally talking about who's, what's a better make. So is that wrong for them to have a preference? Absolutely not. You see, I'm not scrutinizing preference. What I'm scrutinizing is that I've seen people almost get into fist fights because they believe their preference is truth. But what's the truth about vehicles? vehicles are mechanical devices prone to fail. Whether you own a Ford, GM, Dodge, Acura, Lamborghini, whatever it is you own, it will break down and it will fail. So, you know what? Drive the vehicle of your preference if you can afford it. My preference is not what I drive, but I'm glad that I'm driving what I drive because I can afford that. <laughs> You can see me pull in with a Lambo <laughs> next Sunday. I don't know. I'm, my house will be gone, but I'll have a Lambo. <laughs> but anyways, that's, that's all that is is preference. But what's the truth? What's the truth behind all of it? So this is something that I find difficult to find. And you know what? There's so many different avenues and faucets. I got a list of things that we could have fun with where we take preference and we, we, we rewrite that as truth. And I'm not going to have time to go through all of that today. But what I want to focus on is what is the truth? So we read in John, John chapter 14. Jesus is like, I want to say ours but it's within a day of going to the cross. John chapter 14, verse 6 says this. Jesus said to them, to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Is that a selfish statement? Is that, is that a selfish thing to say about God, that no one goes to God only but through Jesus Christ? You've heard me say before that we have a one-way God, and yes, we do. We have a one-way God, and there is only one way to get to God. That's through Jesus. And Jesus says, that's the truth. It's not about your behavior. It's not about what you do. It's not about SMC, EMMC, EMC, AEMC, whatever. What's the truth? The truth is... No one gets to the Father but through Jesus. And then if you, if you fast forward into the New Testament in, in, some, in one of the letters, there's only one of Paul's letters that he writes about this specific topic. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses, uh, just verse 14. So Ephesians 6, 14, we find the armor of God. And Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, 14, he says, Stand firm, therefore having girded your loins with truth. 
So he's talking about this armor of God and what it means to have this armor of God. And if you, and if you look in, you try to depict what this armor is. We have the helmet, we have the breastplate, we have the belt of truth, we have the shoes of salvation, we have the sword of the spirit. But what holds it together? What makes it so you can walk your Christian walk and not be tripping over everything else? The truth. The belt of truth. Have we girded up our Christian journeys with truth or perspective? So that's the title of my service today is Perspective, Whose Perspective? I'm still in Psalm 16. In Psalm 16, verse 3, that's my focal point for today. And, I, and I'm gearing this up because Psalm 16, verse 3, is actually one of the reasons I wanted to preach through Psalm 16. But then in studying this verse 3, it just, it just went like this. And I'm just like, wow. And I shared with my wife earlier on in the week, I'm like, you know, it's not one of these amazing aha theological moments. And I'm actually trying to recant that because it almost is. It's a life changer. It's a, it's a perspective changer. Because now I no longer have to live based on perspective. I get to live based on the truth. So as, you, as we walk this journey together this morning, my focal point is Psalm 16, verse 3, but I'm going to read through the entirety of Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is the portion of my cup. Oh, sorry. The Lord is, is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has, counseled, who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely for you will not abandon my soul to show, nor will you nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for uh, the enlightenment of, of who you are and what you're doing. And that we can't come to you save Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is our savior he is the only way and i pray that we can have that just glowing in and through us i pray that we can maintain that that i want to say standard but standard is the wrong word maintain that that perception that identity of jesus christ as my savior and like the psalmist writes, there's no good in me besides you. Wow. Which perspective are we looking at? I pray that as we, as we go through and we walk this journey together and, and I get to share mostly about a perspective that I've been having and share through expository, uh, exposing what the scriptures are saying, that the people can hear what you have to say to them. I confess my dependence on you. May I set my agenda aside and may I completely surrender to your words and to your love and to your truth. You truly are an amazing God. Father, walk with us in this journey. Walk with us in this 30 minutes that we're going to hear about perspectives and looking at what King David and Jesus went through and practically apply that to our lives. You truly are an amazing God. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 3 says, As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. When I read that, I was just like, Oh, huh, really? Because 
from my perspective, when I'm looking at the saints in all the earth, when I'm looking at King David, um, King David was being attacked by his king. And the really neat thing about King David was King David refused to raise his hand against Saul. You read in, in um, oh, I can't remember if it's in First or in Second Samuel, it's in one of the Samuels, um, where the scriptures actually say God delivered Saul into David's hand. And David cut a little piece of cloth off of Saul's garment. And David repented. So you read that, and you know what it does to my head? I'm like, okay, God delivered Saul into David's hand. For what purpose? Exactly. Do we, I deducted in my head to kill him. But David would not raise his hand against God's anointed. So which perspective did David look at King Saul? Did he look at King Saul as his enemy, as somebody who was trying to pursue and kill him and perhaps annihilate David's kingdom? David's kingdom was greater than what Saul could ever imagine because David was anointed to be the king of Israel and David was also anointed and betrothed to be the father of Jesus. Lineage. There was something that was unstoppable happening. And I, and I can't help but see David looked at King Saul from a perspective of he believes in God. I can't kill him. It wasn't that afraid that, it's not that David was afraid of killing. It's not that David was this perfect saint. You, you read in 2 Samuel, this I know is in 2 Samuel right at the beginning when Jonathan and Saul go up against the Philistines. This is just right after that Saul had went to the witch and there was, he was looking for Samuel. He's like, what do I do? What do I do? This witch brings Samuel back from the dead and this is like, it's not going to end well for you. Jonathan and Saul pursue the Philistines and quickly doesn't Israel just say, we're done. And they start running and the Philistines pursue and they first kill Jonathan. And Saul looks to his armor bearer and he says, kill me because the Philistines are amongst us. And the armor bearer wouldn't do it. And then Saul took his sword and fell on his own sword and killed himself. And the armor bearer just saw and witnessed that the king of Israel is dead and he kills himself. Where this is going is you think David would be happy. You think David would be like, yes, you know what? Somebody looked at it from a perspective like that. And they ran to David and they said, I killed Saul. You know what David did? Killed him. Whose perspective are you going to look at the house of Israel or the house of God or even the church? You see, David wasn't afraid of killing people. David looked at mankind differently. Not based on behavior based on what God has done. This is amazing to me when we look at this, this, this distortion of the church today, when we look at the distortion of truth, and we, we can so easily run down so many rabbit trails of perspective or, 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 or our own preference and rewrite what actually is truth. And I wonder how many are guilty of doing that. We take our preferences and we say, therefore, this is now truth. And today I really want to look at, look at this, the reality of what truth is. And, and before we, we get into um, practical application, I also want to look at this from a perspective of, of like I said at the beginning, when I was going to go through uh, Psalm 16, I want to look at it from the eyes of David writing, and I want to look at it from the eyes of David being a prophet. And this is actually Jesus prophesying through David. So now when we look at this from a perspective of Jesus prophesying through David, did you know God is delighted in you? Have you ever really taken that to heart? 
It's so easy to get caught in the trap of sin. It's so easy to get caught in the trap of guilt and shame. It's so easy to go, I was on such a good path. What did I do? And believe, now hear me, this is truth, and believe that God left you or God is disappointed in you. Well, whose perspective is God looking at you with? Not yours. Yours is distorted already. Yours is based on preference. Yours is based on law. Yours is based on grace. Yours is based on the definition of what law looks like in the church under the covenant of grace. And therefore, we say, God is now distant. God has now left me. God has done all these things, and we're looking at this from based on a perspective. But right here in Psalm 16, verse 3, God says, I am delighted in you. You are the majestic ones. Have you ever thought of that? Peter says we all, not just pastors or ministers. Peter says we all are a royal priesthood. Have you ever thought of that? You're a priest. From God's perspective, you are righteous. And God delights in you. I would love to know what you're thinking right now. Are you thinking about the last thing that you did that was sinful? And thinking that God, there's no way God delights in me. Are you thinking and actually soaking in the, f- the face of God? In Numbers, we used to close with this, with this benediction. And it, it had, make thy face shine upon me. Are you letting God's face shine on you right now? Because he is completely delighted in you. You see, preference is so heavy in our lives that we don't even understand the truth anymore because we've rewritten truth with preference. We've rewritten truth based on our perspective. And Jesus Christ is delighted in you. God is delighted in you. Now, now, let me make this very, very clear. Who is he delighted in? What is he delighted in? King David would not raise his hand against the king of Israel, which was Saul who was anointed. Why not? He was even delighted in him. He even killed the guy who boasted about killing the guy. (laughs) How do you view yourself? Do you view yourself from a perspective of behavior? Or do you view yourself understanding what the truth is? You see, we have a one-way God. And maybe that's not such a hard uh, theology to grasp. And maybe you fully engage in the acceptance of we have a one-way God. But I I want you to do your homework. Jake started this thing with homework. Go read Galatians chapter 3. Read the whole book of Galatians. It's only six chapters. It's not that long. Read it as a whole. And what is Paul's theme when he writes to the church, churches in Galatia? Who's tricked you? What perspective are you now looking at the truth? Because you're no longer looking at the truth. You're completely looking at perspective. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8 says this, Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. And it is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly it does not seek its own it's not provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered does not rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things love never fails so when we read this scripture Most people know 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter and and that it's this amazing love. And I think what we do is we try to take this love and we say, okay, I can base my Christian life on when I examine this chapter and am I able to perform that? 
Am I able to love like that? I, I used to be there. Um, and I would examine and examine and examine and be like, okay, I'm lacking in this area. How do I get better there? And you know what God taught me? I was looking at it from the wrong perspective. Do we actually understand it's not us? It's, we don't have the ability to do it. We have to surrender to the power of Christ living in and through us. And then we get to see love in action. That word love, um, I like the King James Version because it says charity, because when we read this word love, we, we have like love is like a deck of cards. It's like whatever you want, right? You love hot dogs, you love your pets, you love potato chips, you love your wife, you love your car, you love your truck. And we use this word love and it's just like, <laughs> whatever, we love all these things. This word love is actually this word agape. And this word agape is the Greek word that literally means God's love, God's care, and God's life. And when we, when we read this word love in 1 Corinthians 13, the only way we can sustain this kind of love is to actually trust in God to live, it, live his life in and through ours. So what's the truth? What, why does Jesus delight in all of the saints? Why does Jesus delight in you? Well, the amazing thing is, is, is how do we get to Jesus? What, what happens? It's, it's been really cool. Jake, Jake's been witnessing, and he made mention of the baptisms. And um, Pastor Corey asked me to, to help him with, with doing the, with, with dunking them. I'm like, bloop. And um, it's been such a huge blessing. I, I, man, I wish that COVID would go away and that you guys could hear the testimonies of these people, of these saints. Because you know what they're saying? You know what you said at one point in time in your life? You said, God, I'm done trying. I've looked for life in alcohol. I've looked for life in sex. I've looked for life in drugs. And it leads me nowhere. I've looked for life in being a good person. And it leads me nowhere. I still feel empty. So now I'm just done. And I want to kill that attempt. I no longer want to live based on that. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who, what? agape me. You see, his love never fails. And when we look at this and we think of how does Jesus actually delight in me, he doesn't look at you through the eyes of behavior. Now, mark my words. I am not excusing behavior. I am not saying you can willy-nilly and go run and live a, a free life into the lusts of the flesh. We'll get there. But what I am saying is God doesn't view you based on your behavior. David didn't view the people of Israel based on their behavior. He viewed them based on the truth that at one point in time in your life you said I can't do it God I need your help and even if it was this willy-nilly and thinking man heaven sounds so much better than hell and the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus you still made that commitment and knowing and understanding that you can't get there did you know God delights in that? Do you know that God delights in the fact that he is bringing sinners into saints? He's bringing, we, we raise our children. We, you've been raised and, and for independence. Get a job, get a house, make yourself sustainable. But it's, it's actually the complete reverse opposite with God. God says, stop being so independent and come to me and be dependent. 
Trust in me for my love. Trust in me for my grace. Trust in me for how you even view yourself. Because God is delighted in you. Can you actually come to that truth and that revelation of of knowing and understanding that God is delighted in you? Psalm chapter 16, verse 3 has been just really, a really, really big eye-opener for me. So getting, getting into the practical portion of this, of this sermon, what does this mean to today? What does this mean in, in what's happening or how we live our lives today? Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, reads like this. This, is, this was part of your homework, going through Galatians, but I'm going to read this portion for you because, um, like I said previously, mark my words, um, I'm not saying that behavior doesn't matter, but how God views you is not through your behavior. So look what, look what Paul writes here when he teaches passionately the message of grace, the message of you are saved absolutely on what God has done, not on what you're doing or even trying to maintain or keep up a standard of. Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 through 8 says this, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore, a one, uh, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. The one who is taught the word is to share all good, share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will reap also. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So right there in verse 8 is whose perspective? That's the answer to whose perspective are you viewing yourself or even God's children. Are you looking at them from the behavior of their flesh? Look what Paul says. You're going to bear your own load. If you're going to sow a lifestyle of sin, you are going to reap the consequences of that sin. But mark my words. Mark Paul's words. If you are going to sow a life of spirituality, an identity in Christ, you will reap the consequences of sowing those seeds. Who saves you? Jesus. When you sowed that seed of Jesus Christ, he is the one who saves you. He is the one who keeps you. In Ephesians, it says that we are sealed until the day of redemption. The signet ring of Christ is on you. So how dare I look at your behavior and say, you call yourself a Christian? I don't delight in that kind of behavior. You need to clean your act up, and then you can be a Christian. That's heresy. But look at what he says here in Galatians. You who are spiritual, approach them in an attitude of meekness and gentleness. But be careful, lest you fall into that same temptation. Living out of the flesh. You see, I believe the church has been diluted with perspective. I believe even this perspective goes right down into the roots of whether you read the King James Bible or the ESV or the NASB or maybe you read a paraphrase. Heaven forbid you read a paraphrase, you're going to hell. Perspective. Does the translation of your Bible save you? We have a one-way God, and that's through the King James Bible. That's not true. Man, you guys are a tough crowd. (laughs) 
Whose perspective are you going to view yourself? Are we willing to engage into the perspective that God actually views us? Are we able to actually look at people, heaven forbid, even look at the church and say, I delight in you. You are a majestic person. And I have all my delight in what you are doing. Whose eyes are we looking through? You know what? I am so guilty. So, so guilty. Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge so that you will not be, sorry, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. When I look at you (laughs) through the actions and behavior of your flesh, guess what's going to happen to me? My flesh is going to be like, woohoo, ever so evident. Let's keep reading. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Man, I love Jesus' parallels. Like, think of a speck and then think of a log. You're walking around with this log, you've got to be careful, you're going to poke someone's eye out with that thing. Because what are you doing? You are walking around with a behavior of scrutinizing people's behavior. You are walking with a perspective of, I am better, I am going to come and correct you. No. You see, this is strictly, this log and speck is specifically saying, we got to tear all behavior mechanisms out of the way. And we need to start identifying with brothers and sisters in Christ with actually who they are. And when they actually know from a standpoint of saying, hey, look, you are a child of God. You are a daughter of Christ. We are all the brides of Christ. He is our groom. Do you know that? Yes, I do. Are you sure you know that? Yes, I do. Are you absolutely sure that I believe that you are going to heaven and you are saved because Jesus is the one who saves you? Yes, I do. Okay, let's walk this journey together because I stumble and you stumble. And it's no longer about correction. It's actually about walking in such a relationship that that person can now come to you and say, hey, you know who I am in Christ, right? Yeah, I do. I have an alcohol problem. Okay, let's walk on this. Let's walk with this together. You who are spiritual, who can identify with that person, not based on their behavior, can restore such a person to actually understanding that alcohol is a coping mechanism. It hasn't unsaved them. What it's done is brought them into a world of reaping exactly what Galatians says. You are sowing seeds to the flesh and you will reap the consequences of that sowing. And you will suffer these great consequences. And when he's talking about judgment and when he's talking about a perspective of looking at people as saints and looking at people as Christians, we then therefore can unite as a church We can tear and take Satan and tell him to go sit in his gates of hell the way he wants to because you no longer have shame controlling me. I can now come and announce any sin that I have in my life and now the church is going to accept me because who Christ made me, not based on behavior. Can you imagine how If today, if I asked someone to stand up and share with me their grossest sin, and they had the bravery to do so, can you imagine how the rest of the people in here would view that person? You'd see them in no frills. Oh, uh, yeah, that guy's a little bit wonky. Or if somebody got up and said, yeah, um, I'm an alcoholic and I don't know how to deal with this alcohol issue. And all of a sudden, they saw you at the liquor store. Oh, right, what? What's going on? You see, shame has controlled us. And we have been diluted as the church under the perversity of what the world has taught us based on preference. 
And now we take preference, we rewrite truth with our preference, and we say, I accept people who think like me because it's comfortable. But I read Psalm um, 16, verse 3, and David and Jesus says, he doesn't say, those who are behaving like this is my delight. <laughs> oh, yeah, you and you and you, you, I delight in you. Ah, you guys over there, yeah, not so much. Right? And we do that even with denominations and congregations. Oh, well, those people, they act and behave a little bit holier than us. Like, they, they button up their shirts right to the top, and they, they wear all these clothes. But us over here at SMC, because of our preference and the way we dress, well, maybe God doesn't like us as much. <laughs> we just won't get padding on our armchairs in heaven. We'll still get a chair. From whose perspective are you looking at? Psalm 16, verse 3 is not written from a perspective of behavior. It's written from a perspective of truth. And I am guilty of, I, I take this log, it's a big log, and what I do is I write on it the Ten Commandments. I write on it grace, the covenant of grace. And I write on it all these things, and I view you through this law going, okay, you don't understand grace, you're pretty good, yeah, I like you, yeah, let's go hang out, with, have some wings, and oh, yeah, you need some help, we're not going to do wings with you. And I'm viewing you through this perspective of an ideal that I've deemed makes you a good Christian. That's heresy. It's blasphemy. Because Jesus says... I delight in you. You are the living walking among the dead because you've been resurrected into a new creation in Christ. So why do we keep on using these standards, this moral or even ethical code that goes right back to the garden? We are living out of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Whether it's the good side or the bad side, it's still the wrong tree. So whose perspective are you looking at? I am out of time. And like I said, this, this, this has so many faucets. And I want to I wanna close with a scripture. And I want you to try to to the best of your ability, listen to this from a perspective of Jesus talking to you. Are you ready? Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. What is Jesus saying to you? What is he trying to get you to see? This is only like six verses after he's talking about taking judgment out of your eyes. What kind of judgment are you scrutinizing yourself with? What kind of judgment are you scrutinizing the church with? Are you able to look at this scripture from a perspective of Christ? and saying, you are the majestic ones. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. I want you to ruminate on that all week, if you can. And if you're brave enough, I'd like for you to come and talk to me about it sometime. And we can tear down the walls of perspectives, and we can actually examine the scripture and look at it from truth. Because this could potentially be a very scary verse. But it's not. Because you know what? Jesus delights Do you still believe that after you read these verses? Whose perspective are you looking at yourself with? Through the eyes of our crucified Lord? 
or through the eyes of behavior. Jesus is absolutely delighted in you. I say we need to follow David and Christ's lead and begin to look at God's people as the majestic saints who are walking the earth. We are alive in Christ. We are the only ones that can claim an identity in the Zoe life, which is Christ's life. You have at one point in your time said, God, I can't do it. That's the truth. That's salvation. And that's what God wants for us. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for this day, for your love and your life. And I read Psalm 16, verse 3, and it's so challenging to me. And I read it from, from a standpoint, even a perspective of you writing through David, David being a prophet, and you looking at everybody in these pews. And with the deepest agape love, you say, I delight in you. I wish I knew all of your names and I could speak this prayer over you personally. But Jesus is talking to you and he is saying, you are the majestic ones. You have chosen to live a life trying to rid yourself of independence and learn a way of not behavior, but trust in the truth. And the truth is, salvation only comes through Jesus. And he says, I delight in you. You are the majestic ones who walk the face of the earth. Father, I pray you give us the courage to rise to that calling. I pray that you give us the brokenness to, to fall under this amazing power of grace. Because when we begin to look at grace and how you and what you've done and how you've done it, there's no way we can be arrogant or stand proud. And we get to now walk in the amazing humbleness of all that you've done. You truly are an amazing God. We thank you so much for everything. And I pray that as we continue on through the week, and perhaps we struggle with Matthew 7, 13 and 14, I pray that you give us the courage to see it through your eyes. Give us the bravery to take the log out and now just walk with people and be willing to share my shame and my guilt no longer letting the enemy make me hide behind what I believe people will stop loving me over. But we get to be a family. We get to love on one another. Better than that, we get to agape on one another. And you truly have given us all the tools to do it. Christ living in and through us resurrection life father and i'm so grateful for it in jesus's name we pray amen take a moment in silent prayer i'm going to turn to my benediction and then i will i will close with the benediction but take a moment now in silent prayer and just just hear maybe it's not time to talk prayer doesn't mean you have to talk but just hear See what God has to say to you in this time of silence and in actually reflecting on that God is delighted in you. Please pray with me.
Again, thank you, Father, for everything. Come on up, worship team. Thank you for everything you do, blessing us the way that you have, and pouring into our hearts the love that you continually love us with, this unconditional love. It's just uncomprehendable, unbegieblich. And we don't, we're scared of it because we actually still live in preference and we're afraid of truth. And I pray that this Psalm 16 verse 3 can rip through the hearts of the people just like it's ripped through my heart. You will not be mocked. We will reap what we sow. But more than that, I am still a majestic saint walking amongst the dead. Everyone in here are the majestic ones living among the dead. You truly are amazing. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through, through the blood of the shepherd of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, may he equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may go in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be the church people. Be the church.